Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the Allier Treasury Experience for day two. Our first session today is Payments Transformation, Keys to Unlocking New Payment Technologies with Allier Treasury Lead, Karen Willis, and Managing Consultant, Phil Mattis. Again, my name is Jordan Fuger Burmeister. I'm one of the MCs for the event. A few quick reminders before we get going. Attendees have been placed on mute for the presentation. If you have any questions, please submit them in the chat to panelists or in the Q&A portal, and we'll answer, that, answer them at the end of the presentation. We do have two polls today. Please participate, as this allows us to cater the presentation to our crowd today. The session is available for one CTP credit for attending the full 55-minute session. There will be a link at the end of the presentation to the CTP exam, as well as we will email it out after with a copy of the slides. Make sure to post on LinkedIn and Twitter with hashtag ETE2021, as we'll be doing some drawings for Allier Swag and gift cards later in the event. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Allier Treasury Lead, Karen Willis. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I uh, really appreciate everyone participating in the Allier Treasury experience. We're going to begin with uh, Phil Mattis is going to run us through some payment trends and some coverage of Allier. Phil, over to you. We'll cover the agenda. Uh, we're going to do a little Allier intro, payment trends, and then talk about the impact of ISO 2022. Uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technology today, and also AI machine learning and ISO enablement, how to prepare your organization, and then ISO examples. Hey, Karen, I'm back on. Sorry, I was having a little technical difficulties there. No so sorry. It so happens. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you for your patience, everyone. Sorry about that. I'll, uh, I'll jump in here with these first two sections of the agenda, and then uh, Karen will continue with the rest of her presentation. So a little bit about Allier. Allier is a boutique consulting firm specializing in technology implementation, um, has been in business for 16 years, and is really a trusted advisor to our clients with in excess of 250 engagements where we're doing treasury management system and roadmap projects. We uh, help our clients really by partnering, partnering effectively to implement various types of financial software and uh, provide that strategic roadmap guidance uh, as well as best practices in our clients' core processes. Um, and really, one of our bedrock core values is the commitment to excellence and quality. A little more uh, specifics on our, our treasury practices. So we have four treasury practices. Um, the first being advisory services. And we do a variety of consulting projects around advisory, project management support, uh, treasury management system RFPs and vendor selection support, uh, bank services rationalization, and also best practices and process improvement projects. Uh, on the implementation side, we, we do both ERP and cloud systems. On the ERP side, we specialize in Oracle and PeopleSoft treasury projects, as well as or Oracle EBS treasury projects. And on the cloud side, uh, we do cloud strategic roadmaps related to treasury management systems, and then specific software platforms such as Kyriba's treasury workstation, Oracle cloud cache management system, as well as the FIS treasury workstation. And lastly, we also offer managed services post implementation for client support. Uh, again, on the various cloud TMS workstations, as well as Oracle PeopleSoft and Oracle EBS. So here is our NASCAR slide, as many companies like to do. We work with a variety of companies across industries. 
And I'll just kind of linger on this slide for a moment and see, you can see some of the logos. We do work with um, banks and, um, and educational institutions, as well as insurance companies, uh, energy companies, industrial firms, and uh, retail. So really a, quite a diverse set of uh, client names that we've worked with over the past. So of all the things that are in a Treasury Practitioner's Day, um, today we're going to focus on payments. So I'll, I'll kind of move next to focusing some um, some of the, the trends in payments we've seen in, 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 in recent history. And we'll start with uh, kind of a word cloud. And I'm sure you've seen some of these some of these words related to kind of payment, um, new payment concepts and payment innovations such as blockchain and big data, FinTech, ISO 20022, of course, uh, SaaS systems um, and APIs for sure. So the first theme I'll, I'll highlight is faster payments. So definitely a trend here of the, the industry working towards uh, much faster payments. In 2019, the number of countries with faster payment systems increased to 54, which nearly quadrupled since 2014. The US transacted, oh, transacted over 900 billion in faster payments in 2020. And key players in that market included Zelle, the clearinghouses RTP network, Visa Direct, MasterCard Send TM, Venmo, PayPal, and Square Cash. Real time and instant payments support many types of, of payment methods. So, account to account, business to business, business to consumer, and person to person. Uh, the Clearinghouse Collective of America's Largest Financial Institutions has also launched its own real-time payments platform. And this network has a request to pay feature where the payee presents an invoice and the payor makes payment automatically and they're linked so that the corporates automate their payables while the billers automate their reconciliations. Continuing with faster payments, even the Fed is now launching a service in 2023. And it will include core clearing and settlement, 24 seven operations, uh, new features for payment integrity, data security, and combating fraud, uh, a liquidity management tool to support instant payments, and request for payment capability um, as well as payment inquiry, inquiries, reconciliation, and exceptions. The future features will include things such as fraud prevention tools, error resolution, and P2P payments with receiver alias. The next trend I'll highlight is digital payments. So, Enterprises really now outpace consumers in adopting these emerging technologies such as APIs and Blake blockchain, RPAs, digital assistants, artificial intelligence or AI, and even the internet of things. Uh, and just to highlight some of the FinTechs that are really active in that market, there's Ripple, Stellar, R3 Corda, Circle, Veeam, WeTrade, Topalti, Currency Cloud FX, Stripe, Zipmark. I mean, it's, it's amazing how this industry has exploded. And all of these have created kind of their own blockchain or software as a service solutions. Virtual card payments have also doubled between 2015 and 2018 to $160 billion. And they're expected to reach half a trillion by 2024. In 2020, JP Morgan noted, um, was noted as the first bank to create a digital coin representing a fiat currency. 
JPM coin uses blockchain technology as well and enables the instantaneous transfer of payments. Open banking is also a big trend within payments. Um, over 60 plus open banking platforms with uh, APIs are available around the world, up significantly, 73% since 2017. Um, APIs top the, the top three business, uh, the, I'm sorry, the top three applications for APIs, number one being payments at 26%, uh, bank accounts at 25%, and know your customer and identity auth authentication at 12%. FinTech startups are, are collaborating now with other FinTechs and quote, challenger banks, so they can quickly offer a broader suite of services and new customer facing products. Regulations are also emerging in many jurisdiction, jurisdictions, uh, in particular following Europe's PSD2 directive. And there's additional pressure on banks to adopt open APIs, uh, even if they see the business advantage or not. Uh, the open banking market really is at the, at the start of its life cycle. And many banks are, are only um, halfway through kind of this modernization process. And lastly, I'll talk about global trends. So, um, looking forward to 2025, analysts estimate that 80% of enterprise workloads will move to the cloud. 90% of enterprises will use uh, a single sign-on with multi-factor authentication that bridges their on-premise software infrastructure with cloud infrastructure. 85% uh, of customer interactions will be automated using, using technologies such as RPAs, APIs, and AI. And 70% of IT functions will also be automated using these tools as, such as APIs and AI. They estimate there'll be a 100% increase in security related events. So making it even, uh, making it even more critical of, to use these tools such as AI and machine learning. Um, and potentially 10% of the worldwide GDP by 2027 will be stored using blockchain technology. 80% of US firms are currently transitioning to uh, B2B payments from paper checks, kind of the old paper technology to electronic funds transfers. And lastly, really fraud remains the, the top concern. So of, of firms that were surveyed, 55% saying that it was their top payment related challenge. Thank you, Phil. We're gonna get going with our first poll question here before we get into our next section. Is your firm currently utilizing a cloud technology? Yes, you're fully implemented. Yes, but maybe you're mid-implementation. No, but you have plans to implement. No in the future, but no current plans. Or you're unsure if you'll use cloud technology. We'll give everyone about 30 seconds to answer here. See some responses coming in. Just a quick reminder too. If you do have any questions, feel free to submit them either in the Q&A portal or in the chat to panelists function, and we'll make sure to answer them at the end of the presentation. Another five seconds here. Go ahead and get those responses in. And we will go ahead and close it out. So kind of a mixed bag of responses here. It looks like we've got a good chunk of our attendees who are fully implemented but others who are either mid implementation or have some future plans to implement. Okay, uh, thank you, Phil, so much. We'll go ahead and talk now about the impact of ISO 2022 on the world payments systems and SWIFT. 
So ISO 20022, if you don't already know, uh, many do, but it is an XML standard. It is becoming a worldwide standard and it covers cash, securities, trade card, and foreign exchange. So it's extremely important across the financial infrastructure. Uh, it was originally designed back in the early 2000s to deal with SEPA credit transfers and SEPA direct debits. I actually worked with one of our major airlines back in 2007, and we were already at that time speaking with the various banks globally about implementing that service. So ISO 20022, as I mentioned, has become a single common language for the globe. It supports high value payments or wires, low value payment or ACH, real time payments, and now instant payments. So it's becoming extremely important. One thing that many folks don't know is there's an added benefit to ISO, which is really can have a, a significant impact on your business. The unique end-to-end -end payment reference referred to as the UETR, it is mandated within the ISO infrastructure that it goes out on a payment and it comes all the way back, carried forward onto your CAMT ISO bank statement. That allows you to automate reconciliation up to 98%. Some of our clients have received a 98% success rate with that. So it's very, very important. Additional impacts of ISO, as I mentioned, it does enable the 24 by 7 by 365 operations, and it is being used to as the core for many of the bank APIs. The central banks are all shifting to the ISO standard globally, so this is going to be a universal application. Many have already uh, done so, or they have uh, quoted a live date. Typically, 2023 is the last time frame in which the central banks are going to implement. There's just about two outliers, which you can see on a future chart that we have. SWIFT has also used the ISO 2022 to advance their instant payment service. They've been testing in Europe and APAC, has gone well, so they're gonna move over to the North American market. And they now also have what's called a GPI tracker, which allows banks to track a payment all the way cross border through its entire process and credit to the beneficiary. And the banks are now passing that same uh, technology along to their clients. The ISO uh, SWIFT, ISO Global Cross Border Payments are running right now about 300 billion in US dollars daily. So it's a, it's a huge market. By 2023, ISO will represent 79% of the market value for high value payments, which is wires and 87% of the dollar value. It's been adopted in 70 countries, replacing all legacy formats. The US Fed and CHIPS, they did delay. Uh, Alir actually participated on the uh, Faster Payments Task Force back in 2014, 2015, and they did delay a phased in approach and they had decided to adopt the big bang cutover in 2023. So that's coming up soon. And then the GPI tracker service that I mentioned is identifying 40% of payments are credited to beneficiary in five minutes and 50% in 30 minutes. So let's just look at a few charts on the adoption of the SWIFT ISO referencing those statistics I just mentioned. So SWIFT has a plan. They have laid out a very extensive plan for transition. The first portion of the plan, which has already taken place, was to have the banks in their closed user group or CUG, have them uh, convert to ISO first. So that's, that's definitely uh, permeated through the banking environment. The second is a coexistence. It's a two-way translation. And that is actually starting now it is going to be, in my opinion, a somewhat complex situation, but to help that, SWIFT has uh, published a translation tool so that you can go from the SWIFT, FIN, Legacy, MT messages to ISO and ISO back to MT. So this tool can be installed and you'll actually see it in one of our architecture diagrams later in the presentation. And the third will be uh, full functionality for ISO 20022 only. So 
keep in mind that it's coming, it will be ISO 2022 only. SWIFT has identified 2025 as their target date for that. Uh, they did have a caveat saying that after 90% of funds traffic is using ISO, they will turn off the old thin messages. But if you're using those, it is something that you, you know, of course, need to start now because of budget processes, planning the project, and designing your transition. This chart really shows that the uh, North American market is behind. So we are significantly being bested by APAC and Europe. So we need to get moving. You can also see in this particular chart, this refers to the different payment systems that have converted earlier or that are planning to convert. And you can see from the chart that 2023 is the magic year for the US Fedwire and chips and some Can Canada low value system and chaps over in the UK. So let's talk about what's really in the news right now, particularly with Jamie Dimon speaking a lot about this lately, is blockchain and distributed ledger technology. It's very exciting technology, but it definitely is right now for financial markets, a little bit of the wild, wild west. Uh, there are some very uh, good companies out there that have fantastic products, and we'll talk about those a little bit. Um, but of course, for treasurers, this is new technology. So you're probably asking, where can this be applied within my organization? So cross-border payments, it is definitely uh, moving into the payment infrastructure. Clearing and settlement is an important application. Digital identity management, of course, particularly around the payments market. Peer-to-peer -peer payments, which is typically more of the individual mobile technology type of payments. And then invoice financing. So what is blockchain? Blockchain is really a decentralized database. It is shared by parties who do not trust each other. That sounds a, it's an interesting comment, but that is actually the case. The blockchain is designed to handle parties that don't trust each other using a smart contract. So a smart contract is really a computer coded contract that somewhat emulates a traditional commercial agreement that you might have. It does uh, create a ledger and a ledger has rules, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, but it does control all actions by counterparties within the contract. A really important part of blockchain's future growth and its success is the use of oracles. Oracles are trusted external parties that become a unit within the blockchain. And a great example of that would be uh, Bloomberg or Reuters publishing spot rates. They would, be an or they would be an oracle within the blockchain so that every party involved has an identical copy of the spot rate information, for example. Inherent rules within a blockchain is that a typical example would be that total funds must always be uh, upheld. Total funds must always be the same. So in order to achieve something like that, there are three tasks. There's always a check for sufficient funds before a payment is made. And if we deduct one from one account, we must add to another account. That sounds somewhat simplistic, but it is really the underlying uh, benefit of the blockchain and the maintenance of the financial ledger that the blockchain represents. So stablecoin is becoming a very important concept and being talked about a lot more now. What it really is, is a stable cryptocurrency that mirrors the US dollar. So the token, whichever exchange is issuing that token, that is pegged to a basket of high grade investments like T-bills, for example, and that's how they achieve that. Here's a, a very good uh, schematic of what a typical blockchain transaction might look like. So if I wanna send a USD wire, I'm originating one of those as a corporate, 
I'm gonna send it through the digital asset exchange. It's gonna be converted through the exchange. One of the popular ones, um, Coinbase is a great example. I might choose to have it in Bitcoin or Ether or XRP, and then it is stored momentarily, and then it would be converted again over to, say, if I was making a payment to Mexico, across border to Mexico. It would be converted again into the Mexican peso. Here's a great description of the Oracle services. They're very important, and they're, you can see how many different types of oracles exist today for the blockchain structure. I mentioned uh, Bloomberg, Reuters. Banks can become an oracle as well. There's retail payments such as Visa, MasterCard, other blockchains, uh, ERP systems in the back end such as Salesforce, SAP, and Oracle. Uh, event data like news services or flight schedules. And then of course, APIs can also become an Oracle. So another topic that is related, significantly related to uh, the blockchain and digital currencies is the digital USD is a, there's a lot happening right now. The Federal Reserve has felt some pressure, particularly because the uh, People's Bank of China has issued their own DCEP digital currency and they tested it uh, last year, but it's actually becoming uh, more highly used. They also, China has also made all other cryptocurrencies illegal so that DCEP is the only one used within their country. So they've issued that, that legal directive. The Fed would take the digital USD and it would uh, share it with the banks in exchange for reserves. So the banks could then distribute the digital dollars out to their customers. To issue the digital dollar would require a blockchain and distributed ledger. And because the US government really doesn't have that now, they would have to leverage private sector innovation. So some of these companies that you see in the news and we talk about that already have figured all of this out on a technical level. Something to keep an eye out for is that the US policy guidance is coming out here in Q4 2021. The Fed will release a paper in late October on the central bank digital currency and what their plans are. The Federal Bank of Boston has also been performing technology research related to that private sector innovation on how to have the technology in place for the digital dollar. And the president's working group has, uh, will be issuing their policy rec recommendations on regulation for stablecoin. So regulation is coming as well. This slide gives you a, a great sense of what some of the big names are in this particular area. Um, Coinbase, for example, is one of the largest exchanges. Tether is out of Hong Kong, but they are actually the largest issuer of one of the US dollar stable coins. Down in the left, Ava, Lab, Ava Labs, They've recently come out with a blockchain distributed ledger that has the fastest throughput of any distributed ledger in existence today. So there's a lot, a lot of great things happening. For your reference, we are just providing some information on the top firms in this particular technology. Keep in mind there is easily a thousand plus firms involved, fintech firms involved in all of this, but this gives you a highlight. So you can refer in our, uh, our deck as we distribute it after the session today. So AI and machine learning, we just uh, could not, we would be remiss if we didn't at least discuss that briefly today because it is important. 92% of companies have taken a loss due to payment fraud uh, within their revenue. 74% have experienced check fraud. That number is very, very high. That's an incredible number. 54% have experienced loss due to email compromise in 2019. And that's distributed across wire losses for 23% and ACH losses for 20%. And a third of corporates in this survey did indicate that they haven't really received great advice from their banking partners on how to mitigate their risk. 
So how does AI and machine learning work? Um, AI learns from past cases. So as payments are caught uh, within software, for example, and analyzed because they don't meet certain rules, then um, that information is stored. Those characteristics are stored and they're reused as modeling uh, as, as additional payments are processed in the future. So the system uses data to reinforce, refine, and develop new algorithms all the time. So it's always changing and it's always adding and it's always improving its analysis of your payments. It uses the concept of decision trees, which is shown to the right, uh, where you, it to develop its algorithms. And then there are three techniques that are, are used by AI and machine learning. So reinforcement, a supervised learning, which simply means that if there is a, an aberrant transaction or a transaction that is halted, that a human uh, would come in and review that payment and then make a decision to allow the payment to pass on or not. And when, when the human intervention happens, the machine learning continues to learn from that action. And then unsupervised is where it just simply allow payments to go through and allow the machine uh, or AI engine to catch them and hold them. Thank you, Karen. We will get going with our next poll question here. So where is your organization at with implementing ISO 20022? Are you fully implemented and utilizing, currently implementing, have a plan but not implemented yet? No current plan to implement or you're unsure of where to start? Again, we'll give about 30 seconds here. Just another quick reminder while we're wrapping up the poll to please submit any questions in the Q&A portal or in the chat to panelists. And let's go ahead and get those responses in. We will close it out in about 10 seconds. Okay. And it looks like, again, kind of across the board, but right now, no current plans to implement. Karen? That's interesting. Thank you, Jordan. Okay, so let's talk next about how you could prepare since a number of uh, you have not implemented. Let's talk about how you can prepare to implement ISO 20022, remembering that 2025 is a very key year where uh, SWIFT will be expecting all payment platforms to be converted. So this is a diagram which gives you a real sense of what your ecosystem around the ISO should be. The most important part is really the red portion, which shows that you should have in place a payment gateway or financial gateway that supports the ISO format. And you want it to cover both payments outbound, payment confirmations coming back. But in addition to that, you also wanted to cover your bank statements. So right now uh, there are BII2 bank statements, but there also is under ISO and being implemented by the banks, the new uh, CAMT type of bank statement as well. So you could be impacted by your bank on the CAMT statements. The gateway that you implement should have transformation engine, and that's simply the rules that converts, for example, on your left with your ERP application or some outside systems, converts various formats into the ISO format. Also, you can see on the right then, you'll be sending those payments to the banks and the acknowledgements coming back uh, interim payment status, for example, we talked about the GPI tracker, which allows you to track a payment along its life cycle until it reaches the beneficiary. And then of course, a uh, number of clients would use the SWIFT network. For payments, uh, future state to planning your ISO implementation, we do recommend looking at your 
organization and your payment strategy. What's your overall perspective and your overall goals for achieving uh, payment processing and, you know, at a very, very uh, strong solution for that? Payment workflow and processes is critical. How are you going to perform your approvals? How many levels of approval will you have? That's very important. And then, of course, uh, payments landscape normalization. So what banks are you going to use? What account structure do you need? Are you going to use a POBO approach, payment on behalf of approach? Uh, that's what a lot of our clients are doing now. Are you going to use the shared service center? So you wanna look at all of those options in planning. Also, you want to ensure that you follow with the ISO uh, project methodology. One thing that's happened with on-premise versus cloud is that cloud really does require an agile approach or rapid development approach to implementing payments. Uh, it's actually very beneficial in the sense that you can get uh, regions or countries up and running and actually in production, and you don't have to wait for an 18 month project to in ERP, for example, for everything to go live in a big bang, uh, a big bang approach. Just to cover a couple of projects to give you a sense of what we've been working on with our clients. The first one is a full conversion to ISO for a banking and credit card issuer. This was a loyalty card company. They had uh, regions in the US, Canada, and Europe. 20,000 employees and assets of 30 billion with revenue of 8 billion. So with this particular client, we did go in and determine which of the ISO formats do we wanna use? There's many, there are many, many formats. We worked with the banks. So we spoke with each of the banks in scope regarding high value, low value and SEPA. And then we did review the bank requirements. Some banks have specific asks or specific needs that they require in the ISO implementation and you have to be aware of them as you implement. Part of this uh, for future best practices was also to do a vendor beneficiary master data cleanup. So we made that part of the project so that when it goes live, they knew they were in a, a really good optimal state. This particular project also required ERP accounts payable integration. So we had to do some work in that area as well in terms of, of setting up new pay cycles around these new payment formats. That was critical. And then with the ISO, we were able to create some alerts in advance of payments that might cause repair. So is the account currency not equal to the payment currency, for example, or there, were there pay date value date issues? This particular diagram will just provide this in the deck after the session. But one thing I do want to note is in the middle of the diagram, if you take a look at the internal network structure, you'll notice that there is an icon for the uh, MT to MX translator. So keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, Swift is providing a translator. They are making it available to their customers. And there also are some uh, private companies which are also issuing translators as well that might have some enhanced features that you would be interested in. You'll also notice in this diagram that in that same swim lane that there is the OFAC and AML checking that this client was able to centralize as well. So the payments are formatted. They go through a central processor uh, for OFAC check and then they go out through the SWIFT gateway. The second project was actually a cloud project for cloud cash and global payments. It is an investment firm primarily headed within the North America and also a sub substantial presence in Europe. 7,000 employees, 25 billion in assets and 3 billion in revenue. What we wanted to show here is the future state, the ideal future state uh, for an ISO payments implementation using a cloud product. 
So you'll notice in the bottom of the diagram that there is a cloud TMS payment hub and connectivity hub. So this hub is really the heart of this infrastructure. It handles bank statements, it handles payments, it handles payments confirmations. You'll also notice that that particular payment hub can interact with blockchain distributed ledger technology. It also can support mobile payments over digital wallets. And it also works directly integration through the SWIFT network. Here we just wanted to mention several of the key players in the cloud payment SaaS environment. So Kyriba and FIS and Oracle are key, very key players in this environment. Uh, they each have the data hub and the data exchange that we just showed within the architecture diagram. And strong players again are Swift. Swift has a very significant amount of services around ISO 20022 implementation. And again, they are providing the translation tools for this cutover between 2021 and 2025 to uh, final, uh, final implementation globally. G Treasury, Finastra, Treasury Express, Axletree, Bottomline, and Bellin all have very strong functionality as well. So what does ISO do for your company in terms of ROI and TCO benefits? An ISO gateway will lower your risk, both regulatory risk and operational risk. It also improves your interday liquidity view. So you can move faster to re react to your liquidity um, issues or your liquidity excess. It also lowers the cost of reporting and improves analytics. The products that I mentioned have very significant and um, helpful reporting that comes with the purchase of the TMS cloud software. It also automates workflow approval that is built into each of those products. The use of iPhones, iPads, Androids for mobile review and approval of payments is delivered as well. And there is much easier integration of subsidiary and uh, payments from acquisitions that you've made. Mention the payment gateway that has a data exchange model, which can take feeds from virtually any subsidiary that you have and a whole variety of ERP applications. So, um, you know, from SAP to Oracle to uh, Yardi for real estate, for example, there's a whole variety that are automatically able to feed through that payment gateway. And the ease of implementation, implementation for payment on behalf of and shared service centers is really aided by ISO payments and the TMS cloud products. Technical support costs will be significant lower. Uh, what many don't know is that the current products in the TMS cloud offer connectivity support. So once you're implemented, they monitor your connectivity. You no longer have to have an IT staff that is uh, watching that day to day. You also have the ability to consolidate the number and types of bank connections. So you can reduce the number of banks that you're connected to and use the power of the TMS software to support. There's a reduction in file transfer fees because you are able to batch files into fewer files. It also improves state, straight through processing for bank reconciliation. As I mentioned earlier, you have the end-to-end -end payment ID that comes full circle back to the bank statement and you can achieve the 90 plus percent automated reconciliation. It simplifies cross-border payments. And of course, you can centralize your OFAC and AML monitoring and reduces the risk of exceptions. Okay, so that ends our session for today. The next session up is Seeing is Believing, FIS Global Payment Hub and Demonstration, which is a perfect tie-in to our 
to this presentation. Thank you, Karen. We do have a couple questions that came in through the Q&A. Please make sure to submit any additional questions as we do have a couple minutes to answer them here. Um, our first question is, is blockchain practical for treasury? Blockchain will be more practical, and, in, and this is really my opinion. Um, blockchain will be more practical once the central bank currency issuance is resolved with the Fed. I do believe that it will definitely be coming. Um, that's the general consensus. Now, there are specific applications now, which are available actually through software tools, such as Oracle's uh, smart contract and distributed ledger technology. So the technology already exists. I will say that it's mostly used currently for supply chain management, um, but there are very real applications and there are definitely software providers today. The other area where it can be used as in-house banking. So a smart ledger is the perfect implementation for an in-house bank. It keeps the transactions between the intercompany transactions are recorded within the ledger. And that balancing act that I mentioned is very important. Thank you, Karen. Looks like we have another one here. Um, is an ISO 20022 migration mandatory? It is mandatory. Uh, again, 2025 is the target. The banks will begin to apply pressure for you to go to ISO. So you do need to have a plan. What we recommend to our clients is that you start having conversations with your bank about when they will actually enforce that. If you keep in mind the translation tools from uh, FIN MT to MX or ISO, those will exist, but just consider the complexity of maintaining that long-term. Uh, banks likely will add significant fees uh, to your accounts if you do not do the conversion. And kind of following up on that, it also says, um, do TMS systems have functionality for ISO 2022? They do, they absolutely do. So the vendors that uh, we have on our slide, they actually deliver that today. They have a ready library of the ISO 20022, both for payments, payment confirmations, and for bank statements, the CAMT bank statements. And I've got one more here. It says, how do I access AI or machine learning for my TMS? So the vendors, again, um, they're really ahead of the game. They actually deliver the AI um, fraud application within the TMS software. Not every one of them, you wanna, you know, whoever you're considering, you want to get details on that, but the major vendors such as FIS and Cariva, they have fraud detection uh, rules built in within the software. Excellent, thank you, Karen. A couple of quick items as we wrap up. Thank you everyone for joining. We do have links for both our next session, um, FIS Seeing is Believing, FIS Global Payment Hub at 11 Central, as well as the link to the CTP exam is in the chat. We will be sending that CTP exam link to all who have attended along with a PDF version of the slides as well. So go ahead and get that completed. It is an 80% pass rate. If you don't pass it the first time though, you are able to retake it. We wanna thank Karen and Phil for presenting today and thank you everyone for joining. We hope you have a great rest of your day at the Allier Treasury Experience. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you everyone for attending.